Hello, welcome to my program, Elderhood, Aging Gracefully. I am so grateful to Think Tech Hawaii for the opportunity to partner with them and to have at this chance to share with you what I understand to be a phase of life, a wonderful phase of life that you can make, make real and wonderful. I like to coach people on how to, how to make this part of their life the best part of their life ever. We have childhood, we have, we become adults. I mean, childhood, we are adolescents, and we have adulthood. And I say we have an elderhood. It's a stage mm -hmm. of life, and in each stage of life, there are tasks that demand of us, well, ask of us at least, our attention. And when we pay attention to them, when we relate to them, then we have an opportunity to really flourish. I was with my brother this past weekend, and my brother said <clears throat> that there are things in his life that he just can't understand that are going on. Well, he's a year younger than I started to try and coach him, but I, he didn't want my coaching. <laughs> but it, was, it happens that we can sh share with each other, both in group and in one-on-one, -on -one, some of the insights that we have from psychology, from sociology, from uh, medical, and, and um, make this really a wonderful opportunity for us in this world. Uh, I welcome you in the spirit of aloha, um, one poet, said, you know, I don't have any strangers. I just have friends that I haven't yet met. And I consider you to be friends that I haven't yet met. I look forward to that. In my work as a chaplain at Bristol Hospice, I have had the delightful opportunity in Bristol Hospice, Hawaii, to share with people as they go through this end of life stage. Now, I know nobody likes to talk about end of life. All of us think we're going to live well, almost forever, but end of life can bring up so many different, different uh, anxieties that we like to push those away. I, am, I have made myself and had the opportunity with so many wonderful experiences of people and families going through their end of life process that have so deeply enriched me that I'm no longer afraid of even using the words end of life because it does happen for us all. So. How do we approach our end of life? When I was on the East Coast, I was uh, up and down the, the um, Appalachian Mountains. And one day, flying over to Asheville, North Carolina, we were in the mountains, <clears throat> and there were storms underneath us. And so the pilot came on and said, well, I can't just drop down with thunderstorms. I'm going to search for a uh, cruise around here up here and search for an opening. So we cruised around for a while, and then he found an opening, came on and said, we're going down. And he went, zoom, right down to the landing strip, I mean, to the runway. And I think most of us were white-knuckled at that time, just holding on. <laughs> but um, that's the way some of us approach end of life. We wait until there, we, there's a crisis, and then when the crisis hits, zoom. And it, it truly is, right, can be frightening, and it can be uh, upsetting for the whole family system. Um, so that's one way to approach end of life, and hospice care can help at that kind of end of life. End of life. I don't mean to, to say we won't be there for you. But also, there's another way, I think, to look at it. And last night I said, already mentioned, I came from, home, from California, and coming into Honolulu, I don't, do you remember coming to Honolulu with your flight? How does it land? Well, there's nothing like this. It's just as a nice, gentle, well-sustained, strong uh, glide path into the landing strip. And what I like to do with this program and with some of the coaching I do independently is to give a chance for you to make those choices in your life and help you with those choices that are going to provide a glide path into the end of lifetime through your elderhood that makes it a really and wonderful experience. The five tasks that I've identified that are part of this elderhood time, and uh, it's, it's my elderhood, as, excuse me, it's my elderhood as well as others, um, but there are five tasks that I've identified. One is grieving. We do this more than we do grieve at this time than we've done before, and it can surprise us. What's all this grief about? Well, it's about a lot of, lot of kind, uh, lots of losses that we go through. The second thing that I say we do is we sort out our stories. We sort out our stuff, certainly, 
we sort out our stories as well, which are stories about who we are. We often tell ourselves these stories all of our life. And we need to sort those out and mm -hmm. find ourselves saying, is this really me? Who am I now? Am I this story? Or do I need a new story? We can write new stories for this time of our life also. The third thing is forgiving. I don't mean that as a mandate from a religious perspective, though I, I do think and my, our, many religions recognize the benefit of forgiveness. But rather that forgiveness and reconciliation differ a bit. You cannot always have reconciliation. But you can always forgive. And we can always unilaterally forgive and, and release ourselves from the burden of expectation, disappointment, whatever else goes along with the crisis we may have experienced. The fourth thing is preparing, and preparing we prepare internally, that we often have some idea of what life's going to be like after life. Maybe it comes from religion, maybe it comes from our childhood, maybe it comes from our family or our culture, and we, we, begin, to, uh, we begin to rehearse that. And do I really believe that? What do I expect? What I think is really going to happen? Sorting that out and making sense of that. But also in preparing, this is one of the wonderful things about Hawaii, we have so many resources available to assist us. And one of the things I'm committed to as a hospice chaplain and this program is giving all of my viewers a chance to know what kind of resources are available, especially in the hospice care. So that as you come into that glide, if it seems appropriate and you want to move into hospice care, you're going to already feel comfortable with it. You're going to feel, this is, I know so much about it now that you'll be able to feel comfortable about that kind of a decision. And uh, finally, letting go, and I touched on letting go last week, and that's a profound experience. But today we're preparing again, and I am happy to introduce you to one of my favorite people in the world, Roxanne Cruz, <laughs> who you. is part of the staff of, mm -hmm. of, uh, of hospice, of Bristol Hospice Hawaii. Roxanne, I welcome you, and thank you so much for this opportunity to be in conversation about social work. Mm -hmm. What does a social worker do anyway? Yeah. What do we do? <laughs> so, would you like to start us off with just a, a kind of um, commentary uh, or talk story about yourself, about how you came into hospice care, where you've come from, how you've been, how you grew up, perhaps even, mm -hmm. just in a quick way? Sure. So I was born and raised in Palolo Valley, and I moved to Maui um, for a time, for about 10 years, and then yeah. I came back home. But I worked for the Sheraton Moana for 25 years in hospitality, and so I got hurt and decided to go back to school. Uh -huh. And so I went back to school. Um, I started volunteering for Kids Hurt Too, which is a, a nonprofit set up for kids that are grieving uh -huh. the loss of someone any family member. A unique kind of grief experience, Yes, right? yeah, it's, it's grilled, I mean, it's uh, built more on the children, so it's more play therapy, you know, more of an outward yeah. instead of inward, whereas adults usually put it inward, right? And the kids get out their grief. Yeah. So, they have to physicalize it and get mm -hmm. it out. They get it out it. through it, different styles, right? Not, instead of, not necessarily communicating about the grief. Yeah. Yep. And, um, Every time I go to the meetings, there were a lot of social workers that were older than me that said, I just graduated my master's. So I thought, you know, I think I'm going to go do that. And I really thought I would get into the bereavement side of hospice. And then I went out and did a visit with the family, and I thought, this is incredible because they're letting us into their home at their most vulnerable time. You know, and when a social worker comes in, it's, they're still shell-shocked. You know, like what they told me, I have six months. So, you know, they, they're still, it's still new, still raw, you know, and just helping them through that process. Yeah. yeah. Crystalhospice-hawaii.com is the website where mm -hmm. people can get introduced to the first introduction to hospice care. Mm -hmm. But um, you really personalize it in a beautiful way. So, yeah. so you're talking about that entry. Have you found, uh, have you found, many barriers to getting in, entering into the home and into their vulnerable right. time of their lives? So, you know, being born and raised here and growing up in Hawaii, yeah. you know, when we heard the word hospice, we instantly thought death. We instantly thought they're going to starve you to death. 
it's just all the myths that we have that are surrounding our local communities about it. But in actuality, it's such a great um, tool that is there for families that will help them through the process of grieving or financially, getting their paperwork in order, you know, making sure that their children, if they have kids, young children, that they're prepared and have counseling set up. So, you know, I, I, I really believe um, that once our families have hospice coming in, they say, why didn't we start sooner? You find that a lot. You find that a Almost, lot of time. because yeah. usually they don't come on to the end. So, yeah. you know, when they come in on, if you come on when you first get diagnosed, you, we have time that we can help prepare you I mean, chaplains is amazing work. Our chaplains exactly and nurses right. and yeah, everyone exactly that's involved, right. CNAs. So, you know, so being here and being local, I understand the stigma that we have. And then another stigma they have about social workers are we either going to take their kids away, we're going to turn them in for fraud. I mean, you know, we just yeah, have this stigma, yeah, but really yeah. we're just coming in to help provide that psychosocial support. Yeah. And sometimes they just need someone to listen to them. That is not family. It's not going to question and, you know, bring in their biases. And I think, I, I, for an example, I had a nurse practitioner that actually works out in the community, and I had her mother. And um, so I asked if I could sit with her. And after we're through, she started crying. She said, I understand now what a social worker does. Because even in her, she was thinking, what does a social worker do? Like, sure. why do we need a social worker on our team? And um, after we sat and had the, let her just express herself, uh, she, she said, yeah. I understand now why. Uh, so, yeah. Well, you've said a couple of things I think are really mm -hmm. important, Roxanne. You've, you've said a team. Yes. And, and you've said, uh, why do we have a social worker? Those kinds of things mm -hmm. are questions. That comes up an awful lot, yes. I'm sure. And I'd like to say that, and I often say, <clears throat> what little I've, begun, I've known, I've been in hospice care for several years, but Cicely Saunders, who was the founder of the hospice mm -hmm. movement in England, um, identified <clears throat> what she called total pain. She identified four, four pains. Yeah. You know this. Oh, yeah. Well, may I do it? Yes, you're the boss. <laughs> <laughs> the first pain is, of course, physical. Physical pain. The second pain is relational. Mm -hmm. And the third pain is economic. Yes. And the fourth pain is spiritual. Well, on a... IDT, or an interdisciplinary team, as we call it, we address all four of those mm -hmm. with professional, certified, the best, best people that we possibly can have, yes, I think. I think. And we have a, for the physical pain, we have nurse, nurse medical director, mm -hmm. CNA, CNA, heroes in my book, mm -hmm. for the family and the economic, social worker, and spiritual chaplain, and mm -hmm. it, there's some overlap in some of that, but all four, it's because the patient experiences this, mm -hmm. not because we said, oh, we're gonna have this program and we're gonna make it good, but because that's how we want to address the Right, because it's not an individual yeah. of, let me go in and help them individually. It's a whole team that goes in that encompasses the family, yeah. um, because, I will go in and say, well, how are you doing? You yeah. know, and I say, how, how, how's your prayer life going? And then they say, oh, I'm really struggling. I'll call the chaplain. You know, so it's very important to have that communication open. You know, mm -hmm. if they say, you know, I really need three <coughs> days a week um, having my mom cared for with, by the CNA, then we can talk to the nurses. So mm -hmm. the nurses will call me or email and say, okay, they have a lot of psychosocial problems. There's some yeah. family dynamics going on. Can you come in? You know, so as a team... Yeah we can address their needs. Yeah, and this is the most exciting part of, for me of, of uh, at least this is my perception of, my, of hospice care is working as a team. Mm -hmm. We are human with one another. We get to know each other. We know the strengths that we bring to mm -hmm. the table and we want to make those kinds of strengths available to everybody. We're gonna take a minute break here and our break is gonna give you a chance to see some more about Think Tech Hawaii, this marvelous organization. And then we'll be back with Roxanne for some of those specifics. What does a social worker do anyway? <laughs> be right back. Thanks to our Think Tech underwriters and grantors, the Atherton Family Foundation, Carol Monley and the Friends of Think Tech, the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education, Collateral Analytics, the Cook Foundation, Dwayne Carisu, 
the Hawaii Community Foundation, the Hawaii Council of Associations of Apartment Owners, Hawaii Energy, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, Hawaiian Electric Company, Integrated Security Technologies, Galen Ho of BAE Systems, Kamehameha Schools, MW Group, the Scheidler Family Foundation, the Sydney Stern Memorial Trust, Volo Foundation, Yuriko J. Sugimura. Thanks so much to you all. back to elderhood aging gracefully uh, some of you are not even don't even really qualify for elderhood yet uh, you will eventually <laughs> but you may know someone who does and with whom you have a close relationship and anything that we we address in this program anything we address today anything we address in the rest of our our videos for this show can be a great resource for you and you can always call call uh, hospice uh, uh, Bristol Hospice Hawaii, or con connect with me through Larry G at live-connections.com, and we will respond with uh, all the resources that we have to offer you. Today, I have with me the, one of our fantastic social workers, and they are heroes, heroines in my book for all that they do, um, and her name is Roxanne Cruz. And Roxanne told us a little bit about her background and how she moved into hospice care. And I have asked her if she would share with us some of the things that are done uh, by, by a licensed social worker within the context of that team work that we, we offer to the patient and family. So first of all, Roxanne, I'm gonna mm -hmm. give you a list of some questions. So first of all, how do I qualify for hospice care? Well, oh boy, that's technical. That's a liaison question, but I'll, I'll try to answer. You know the answer. Though. You will be, you get qualified by uh, two doctors to be to um, uh, be approved for hospice care. You have to have a diagnosis of six months or less. Um, yeah, I think that that's the basics so of basically. why you will get um, qual how you get qualified. Who so through your it? doctor. So. Hospice is free. It is through Medicare. Everything, you, you know, your supplies, the, everything that you receive is free. So there's no, and we have to talk about their DMEs, wheelchair, hospital beds, everything that you can think of um, will be provided for each family uh, tailored to their needs. <clears throat> she used the term DME, which stands for? I don't know. Medical <laughs> equipment. Directed <laughs> medical I do, but I can't remember. It's medical equipment. That's what it is. <laughs> so everything is provided. I, I think that's provided. one thing, again, that people might not, you know. And medications understand. that are um, mm -hmm. to do with your diagnosis is also covered. <clears throat> so you wouldn't have that cost. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm a hospice patient, and I, um, I, I want you to come over and talk to me about where, where shall I live? What's the best? I want to live at home. Can I live at home? Yes, of course. Most patients, um, I think 90% are in their own homes, and then we have patients in facilities. But if the patient says, I want to remain in the home, and he has the support, or her have the support of family or hired caregivers, you know, it's, it's actually better for them to be in the home because then the family, it's more personable. It's not like, oh, you're in a facility and you're, you're sick and you're ill and then you're gonna pass. But when you're at home, you have the support of your family and friends. I mean, it could be anyone, pastor, chaplains that actually know them on a personal level also that can actually come in and help with the family. Yeah, very mm -hmm. good, because then, then I have my own familiar support system right. as well as this new one that's coming in right. to give assistance. Right, and statistics show you do well at home yeah. versus, yeah. you know, in a so what about So what's the difference between Medicaid and Medicare? Well, Medicare covers for the elderly, right? 65 and older, you can get Medicare, everyone, right, across the state. Medicaid is for the low-income uh, families, you know, like so that are on a quest mm -hmm. um, that needs uh, help, they're not 65, but they'll get Medicaid if they're younger than the 65 uh -huh. or older. So Medicaid provides room and board. 
Medicaid where, provides yeah, but room not and board. Medicare. The Medicare it, does not. Yes. Okay. Yes. So it depends. Okay. So if I'm going, if my kids decide, well, that's too bad, Dad. We're going to place you. Yeah. And we think you'd do better off not here because we can't really care right. for you because we're stressed. And they're working, and, and they I'm have working. kids. Yeah. Yes. And they say, and I say, I don't want to be a burden. I really want to go somewhere mm -hmm. where I relieve you of that care mm -hmm. of that pressure. And uh, but I don't have enough funds. I don't have personal insurance, mm -hmm. long-term care insurance. Mm -hmm. I don't have anything to sustain other than a regular insurance. Can I get Medicaid? Well, you can um, try to get Medicaid because Hawaii is a higher uh, income. Oh. Yeah, so you, it's not, you know, you, I think you can have, um, don't quote me, but you can have up to like 700000 equity and you can get qualification. So it depends on, on one, your insurance and, and your family, you know, to get together and say, you know, we're, we're going to have to pay 7000 for private care. But if you bring uh -huh. someone in the home, private care, it will be 24 7. It costs more oh, than yeah. what it would at a facility. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So I invite you in and I am ready to share all of my financials with you. Oh. I don't, uh, social workers do not handle financial. Oh, okay. Yes, so we do not call a lawyer. We, we can give you resources, uh, you know, um, legal ah. affairs, legal aid. You know, we can give you the resources. You know, there's Scott Gardner. There's a lot of um, companies that can help prepare the family to um, either get them in, yeah. in the uh, nursing home or at home. So you make the connections. You have all the resources that I'm going to need. Yes. That you'll connect right. me with. Right. To connect you to the right person for finances. So okay. as a social as a social worker, we go over the do not resuscitate, uh, the post, it's called P-O-L-S-T. And um, we want to know what your wishes are. Because when you are diagnosed, it's all about what you want. Sometimes the family wants different things and the patient saying, no, I want, this is what my wishes are and I'd like it to be respected. So yeah. That's why you have the post because it's his, their wishes. Would you? This is P O L S T. What does that stand no, don't for? Don't ask me for those. Physicians, Physicians authors of something. But it yeah. tells the physician and it tells the community what your desires are. What your are. desires yeah. are. And so even in the families, when there's pilikia, we say trouble, mm -hmm. um, we can bring out the post and say, this is the wishes of the patient. And so that's who, you know, you're going to want to, we listen to is what their wishes are and what they desire. If they want to be full code, they can be full code. So it's actually what the patient wants. And if the patient is um, past that stage where he's not communicating, most times they will have it in their will mm -hmm. or they have it on an advanced health care directive. Yes, advanced it, directives. Right. So, and if they don't, then you need to find a surrogate. So, um, so I can be confident. Oh, sorry. So I can be confident that my wishes are going to be respected by my family and physician and everybody, mm -hmm. even though it may be difficult for them. I have to clarify that with them ahead of time. Yes. Okay. Okay. But the social worker will help me do that. Oh, yes. We can have a family meeting or I can talk oh. to the family separately or we oh, can, really? you know, we can, it can be worked out just so that the family understands where the patient's coming from. So this was another thing. So. So I'm, I'm diagnosed, I tell my family, my, and I have a brother that really doesn't like me at all, and mm -hmm. all he says is, oh, well, about time. <laughs> or he really doesn't have a very good relationship. And I, and I have a, an ache about this relationship, is there, and I share that with you. Mm -hmm. I share it with the chaplain. Is there a way that maybe that can be the end of life kind of dealt with? Sure. I mean, you know, we can ask the patient, do you have a number? Would you like us to call them? Would you like us to connect with them? And, and then we can go from there. So you'd be an advocate for me at sure. that point. Sure. We advocate for the patient. And if that's his needs and desire, we want to help them fulfill that yeah, need. Right. You know, but even in hospice, we have, uh, which is called the Dream Foundation. Um, it's like a, the cat the, for uh, youths that have Make-A-Wish Foundation. Oh, yeah. But the adults have... A dream foundation. Oh, they do. Yes, we do. And so we can apply our patients and say, I've had people fly from here to Tahiti 
Because they want to be with their family or a family member or the patient wants to go to um, Disneyland for the last time or they want to go to Las Vegas. Yeah. And so we can apply for that and they will make that wish come oh, true. Neat. So I they have their that. own. Yeah, they have their own. We yeah. make a dream come true. Yeah, It's called Dream Foundation. Dream Foundation. Yeah, for adults. For adults. Cool. Yeah. So if we are, it's better than if we are, if I enter in, I get my diagnosis, then I enter into so, to, uh, hospice care right at the beginning of my diagnosis, mm -hmm. then I have all that time to work with the social worker yeah. to get the resources. And it's still, you still need to qualify. So even sure. if, you, unless you, if you're like a stage four, or you know, you're yeah. like, then of course you're going to come right on you know, being diagnosed. And a lot of that's, we have a lot of patients like that. They went in for a call and found out they had lung cancer or, you know, really yeah. devastating um, things. So yeah, they can come on to, and then we do have more time to work with them. You know, and so we can work, oh, you, do you have a wish? You have a goal? Because it's about living, right? So, you know, not just, you don't have to stay home. You don't yeah, have right, to be in the right. bed. It's about you, living. It's about living. And that, that is right. what it's about. That's yeah. Great. Yeah. We have a, just about a minute and a half. Is there a, a quick story about one of your patients without breaking confidentiality, of course, that mm -hmm. you could share? Well, I had a patient that um, he was on the younger side, 50, you know, on uh -huh. the younger side. And um, he loved Disney. And we set it up where he could go to Disneyland through the Dream Foundation. But then he started declining. So what we did is we brought it to him. So... Uh, the nurse, Christy, and I, you know, dressed up a little like a fairy tale, and all his family came over. And so we had a really? celebration of life. Oh, wonderful. And we had all the Disney characters, and we brought, I mean, it was really great. Oh, he <laughs> smiled the whole day. I mean, he uh, was so thrilled. So we have a lot to offer patients and families. And, um, and if we even, I think if people that work for hospice, we are special. Why? Because we really care. And social workers are special because they're so social. <laughs> yeah, we are. <laughs> I am so happy you came to help me out with this, Roxanne. Yeah. Thank you so much. And you all, all Bristol Hospice dash, get on the website if you like. Call us at uh, Bristol Hospice dash Hawaii.com, connect. And I'm happy to respond, Larry G at live dash connections.com. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Two weeks from today will be our last. For the year program for the year and uh, I hope you'll come join me again Help.